Around the world, cyber citadels are crumbling. Ukraine, Romania, Poland, Kuwait, South Korea. Hackers are being rounded up. A cybercrime gang thought to be based in Russia has claimed it's behind the hacking of payroll data affecting companies, including uh, uh, Boots, British Airways uh, and the BBC too. Uh, uh, it, it, when, they, when they set out with this and they simply want it over. But again, the focus is on, on Russia. We know most of these ransomware attacks emanate from... On July 5th, 2014, the Secret Service had been notified that a notorious international cybercriminal was on Maldivian soil and was about to take off at the airport. Quickly, the U.S. agents, together with local authorities at the Maldives, apprehended him and discovered along the way that the young man was apparently on a vacation with his girlfriend after stealing over $169 million in more than a decade of hacking. At the time of his arrest, the feds recovered his laptop, which contained 1.7 million stolen credit card numbers. He had used this kind of stolen information to foster his hacking and cyber theft schemes for a whopping 12 years of his life. This man was such an international menace that his time as a suspect and known criminal had led the feds to lose hope one too many times of ever getting him arrested. However, everything changed when he made one terrible and costly slip up. This is the story of Roman Seleznev, the controversial cyber criminal who had caused an international stir in the cyberspace the US and even Russia. Roman Valerovich Seleznev was born in the city of Vladivostok, Russia on July 23, 1984. His father was Valery Seleznev, one of Russia's prominent politicians, and his mother was an unnamed housewife. At the early age of two, his parents got divorced and ended up living a life that was far from comfortable with his mother. Both of them, along with four other families, lived in a room that was approximately 10 square meters. While his mother worked to make ends meet, Seleznev busied himself with school and computers, dabbling into the arts of technology whenever there was time to spare. He later furthered his education in that field, going as far as working on a degree in mathematics and computer science. However, things took a turn for the worse at this point in his life. Seleznev's mother died from alcohol poisoning when he was 17, and shortly after, his maternal uncle kicked him out of their apartment. This development marked the beginning of a new awakening for Seleznev as he started making some life-changing decisions in the months following his mother's death. First of all, he quit school because he no longer had the zeal to continue any further. Then, subsequently, he became unemployed, only managing to land jobs that paid little. When he got frustrated with this turn of events, Seleznev decided to do something different and illegal. Since he was adept at cyber-related stuff, he delved into hacking. With time, Seleznev began hacking into servers to steal credit card data and selling stolen data to other criminals in cyberspace. His years of crime amounted to an estimated $169 million loss to businesses and financial institutions, and this led him to receive the longest sentence for hacking-related charges in the United States. It was a tedious case to crack in cybercrime history. Seleznev had such a tender background, and no one would have expected the chaos he brought to the financial world. So looking at his roots, how did a young, promising man like this enter his world of cybercrime? Seleznev was unemployed, so he needed money to cover his bills and perhaps fund the lifestyle he was about to create for himself. To achieve this, he started by stealing cards and selling them on the dark web. He continued this way until a breakthrough came in 2007, when he stumbled on a stash of credit cards and sold them off for a lot of money. He continued his petty criminal activities, even after he got married and had a daughter. However, he hit a turning point once again sometime in 2009. When his wife and daughter were out on vacation, he was robbed and tortured one night. At this point, he vowed that he would quit his crimes and start doing honest and respectable things. With this resolution in mind, he took to the cyber streets of cardingworld.cc in June of 2009 and sent an announcement. The shocking thing, however, was that the announcement was not of him quitting, but of his revised work rate. A screenshot of this notice was recovered from the forum in clear details, Seleznev was quoted to say, Hello, my dear customers. Sales will be until 20 July 2009. Don't lose your chance. 
After that, we will end our work forever. Minimum order, $1,000. All clients will get a free checker on the amounts of dumps you buy. American Express, $1 per card. Visa, MasterCard, Discover, $5 per card. Seleznev's resolution had a different meaning and method, and he was ready to put it to practice. How did he do this, you may ask? Seleznev began his life of crime in the early 2000s, and from this time until his arrest in 2014, he went by a total of four aliases, Track 2, Bulba, NCUX, and Tupac. The US law enforcement agencies narrowed their search to these pseudonyms and categorized Seleznev's criminal history into three periods. This man was not exactly your typical complicated hacker. That said, what did he do that amounted to three periods of criminal history for the U.S. authorities? Seleznev had been on several hacking forums since 2002, and he engaged in the sale of stolen identity information. During this period, he adopted the username NCUX, which was a Russian word that translates to sick or psycho. Fast forward to 2005. He started hacking and selling credit cards as he saw how profitable the trade was. Unfortunately, just when the feds thought they were closing in on the identity of NCUX, they saw what eventually was the last post of the hacker on the forum. In this post, he declared he was retiring and going out of business forever. But as you probably guessed, Seleznev was far from done with his money-making scheme, as he had something newer up his sleeves. In September 2009, Seleznev joined Carter.su as Track2 and introduced himself as a trusted vendor of dumps. He accepted new buyers who agreed to pay deposits up front. The deposits were for one of two account packages, the basic and corporate account. The basic account was a deposit of one Bitcoin which was roughly 624 US dollars, while the corporate account amounted to a deposit of 20 bitcoins, which was about 12,484 US dollars. Not long after he started, however, Track2 announced that he was closed and a reseller named Bulba was taking over. Unknown to Seleznev, these series of successions gave the Secret Service something to work with, as he kept leaving a trail for them to follow each time he shut down a previous profile. After moving from track 2, Seleznev reintroduced himself once again, but this time he used a new alias. Hello, my name is Bulba. I am official reseller of track 2. Bulba.cc opened because track 2 name closed registration and don't accept new customers. With this new account, he actively responded to private messages from interested buyers. In one of the correspondences between Bulba and a potential client named Kilobit on the forum, it's shown that the customer was referred to Bulba by Track2 for the sale of 100 PCS gold and plat mix. After Kilobit had asked for the price and had assured that if things went well, they'd be regular every three to four days a week, Bulba replied concisely by stating, same price, $1,300, but they mixed, classic, gold, etc., all mix. Kilobit inquired further about this mix product, reiterating once again that they were looking for a serious supplier to which Bulba responded, Mix, then mix. All types of cards, true random. I don't sort anything credit card or debit. It's mix. Ratio is very good for this type, about 100 to 93, valid. And yes, you can buy it checked, so all 100 will be valid. At this point, the Secret Service was closing in on Seleznev. But just when they were about to make a move to capture him, Seleznev was injured in a terrorist bomb attack in Morocco in April 2011. He was medevac back to Moscow as his condition was pretty serious. The attack left him in a coma for a few months and this made the authorities take a step back in their hunt for him. All the while, they kept monitoring his profiles online to be sure he was truly the mastermind behind Bulba. They got their confirmation when the person who handed the account during his, Seleznev, time on the sickbed kept mentioning that their boss got into an accident and buyers had to wait. This was an indicator that their findings were right without a doubt. Sadly, nothing could be done regardless as Bulba closed in January of 2012. But was this truly the end of Seleznev's hacking spree? Seleznev started a new shop in 2013 under the name Tupac, which, as you probably know, had the famous rapper as the face of the brand. The shop showcased a large volume of stolen credit cards, and this attracted the attention of cyber intelligence once again. 
He was the best dumb market in cybercrime forums and was well respected among like-minded cybercriminals. Not long after the authorities were able to link Tupac.cc with Seleznev, the cybercriminal they had been hunting was once again in the limelight and he lived extravagantly through his social media accounts. How are the feds going to handle this? As earlier stated, Cyber Forensics managed to link a lot of malicious servers to Seleznev's IP address and other email accounts connected to him. Prior to his arrest, he was indicted on the basis of him being part of a criminal cyber group that hacked into restaurants between 2009 and 2011 and stole card data from the store point of sale devices. In addition to this count, he was indicted for 29 felony charges as well. After a series of malicious digital footprints had all led to his name, cyber intelligence were 100% sure that they had gotten the man behind the 14 year long hacking empire. But unfortunately for them, their chances of catching him didn't present itself quite easily. First, there was the case of him being injured from the 2011 bomb attack in Morocco. And secondly, there was the issue of him living on Russian soil and slipping through chances of extradition. With these factors put together, how then was Roman Seleznev arrested? Seleznev was arrested in the Maldives in 2014. For someone who was on the watch list of US law enforcement agencies, Seleznev was none the wiser when he decided to leave Russia and travel openly. Additionally, he didn't protect his hacking empire in any way. His security measures were neither hardware nor software based. Nothing was encrypted and his laptops were only secured with lame passwords that the feds could easily crack. These series of foolish mistakes cost him big time. The US Secret Service, in collaboration with the local police, apprehended Seleznev at an airport when he was on his way to Russia with his girlfriend. Swiftly, he was flown to Guam by private jet and made his first court appearance there. Then, later on, he was moved to Seattle, where he was placed in federal custody pending his hearing. Given the severity of his crimes, who knew what the law had in store for him? In October 2014, the indictment against Seleznev grew to 40 counts. He was found guilty of 38 charges, all of which included 10 counts of wire fraud and 9 counts of hacking. At sentencing, he was given 27 years in prison in 2017. His victims were said to be 3,700 financial institutions and 500 businesses worldwide, and millions of individual credit card holders as well. Seleznev's case was unprecedented as a criminal who had pulled off fraudulent hacking of this scale and had never been caught and tried by an American jury before. Considering this fact, do you know how the sentencing was perceived by the public? Seeing that his punishment was the longest ever given to a cybercriminal in the US cybercrime history, the sentencing was contested. This was all the more pressing because Seleznev had pleaded guilty, asked for clemency, and was ready to help the authorities in their efforts to catch other cybercriminals. Igor Litvak, Seleznev's lawyer, brought this argument to the court, stating that his client was willing to accept responsibility and should therefore be given a lighter sentence. Litvak's argument was that Seleznev was a victim not only of his painful, heartbreaking background, but also the tense relationship between Russia and the United States. The arrest and sentencing of Seleznev was put out to be a political objective, given that Seleznev was the son of a member of the Russian Duma. It sent an ugly message to the Russian government. Following his capture in 2014, the Russian government condemned the arrest as an illegal kidnapping. A tweet by the Russian embassy in USA was shared to corroborate this statement. It read, Arrest of Russian citizen Roman Seleznev, who de facto was kidnapped in a third world country, is unlawful. Then in a statement made by Seleznev and read by his lawyer in court, the decision made by the United States government was said to demonstrate to the whole world that he, Seleznev, was a political prisoner. Litvak was relentless in his plea for leniency for his client. In addition to Seleznev's background and the political implications of his case, Litvak also went on to highlight Seleznev's health complications from the 2011 bombing adding that he had been through a series of tragedies and a punishment this severe would amount to a death sentence. 
Seleznev reiterated his willingness to help fight cybercrime, and Litvak stated that his client had proved his commitment by arranging to give the US government four of his laptops and six flash drives while also engaging in discussions related to hacker activities. Currently, he is being held at the medium security prison FCI Burner in North Carolina.